You've probably heard of tokamaks if you've heard of fusion energy. These devices, which are in the shape of a donut, are meant to trap plasmas, which are ionized gases in magnetic fields while heating them to the very high temperatures needed for hydrogen nuclei to fuse. Tokamaks are the workhorses of fusion. They are solid, symmetrical, and easy to build, but progress has been slow with them. Today's video is about the Germany's new nuclear fusion reactor. But before we start our video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon as well. So let's get started. Now the rebellious cousin of Tokamax is coming out of hiding. In the northeast of Germany, in a shiny lab, scientists are getting ready to turn on a fusion device called the Stellarator, which is the biggest one ever made. Wendelstein 7X is the name of the 1 billion euros machine. It looks like a 16-meter wide ring of shiny metal with devices of all shapes and sizes. A lot of cables going in different directions and technicians tinkering with it here and there. It looks a bit like Han Solo's Millennium Falcon after it got into a fight with the Imperial fleet and had to be towed in for repairs. Inside are 56-ton magnet coils that are twisted in a strange way, as if an angry giant had stepped on them. Even though Stellarators are similar to Tokamaks in theory, they have been overlooked in fusion energy research for a long time because Tokamaks are better at trapping gas and keeping the heat needed to keep reactions going. But there are many things about the dolly-like devices that could make them much better candidates for a commercial fusion power plant. Once started, Stellarators run in a steady state on their own, and they don't have magnetic disturbances that can bend metal like they do in Tokamaks. Unfortunately, they are so hard to build that they may be even more likely than other fusion projects to go over budget and be late. Thomas Klinger, who is in charge of the German effort, says that no one knew what it would take to build one. Bogey 7 x could be a big change. The machine is located at a branch of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics IPP, that Klinger runs. It will start up in November after getting approval from the government. It is the first large-scale example of a new type of Stellarator that was made with the help of a supercomputer and has had most of its problems with containment worked out. If W7X performs as well as or better than a tokamak of the same size, fusion researchers may have to rethink where their field is going. People from tokamak are waiting to see what will happen. People all over the world are excited about W7X. David Anderson, an engineer at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, says this. Stellarators have the same problem that all fusion devices must heat and hold a gas at more than 100 million degrees Celsius, which is seven times hotter than the center of the sun. This kind of heat takes the electrons out of the atoms, leaving plasma of electrons and ions. The ions move fast enough to overcome the force that makes them repel each other and join together but it also makes it impossible to hold the gas in a regular container. Instead, a magnetic cage holds it. A current carrying wire wrapped around a tube makes a straight magnetic field down the middle of the tube, which pulls plasma away from the walls. Many of the first fusion researchers bent the tube into a donut-shaped ring, or torus, so that particles couldn't get out at the ends. This made an endless track. Advertisement But the torus shape creates another problem. Because the wire coils are closer together inside the donut's hole, the magnetic field is stronger there and weaker toward the donut's outer rim. Because of the imbalance, some of the particles go in the wrong direction and hit the wall. The solution is to add a twist that moves particles through areas with high and low magnetic fields so that their effects cancel each other out. The twist is put on by stellarators from the outside. Lyman Spitzer, an astronomer at Princeton University, made the first Stellarator in 1951. He did this by bending the tube into a figure-eight shape. But the lab he set up, the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory in New Jersey, switched to a simpler method for later Stellarators, wrapping more coils of wire around a traditional torus tube like stripes on a candy cane to make a twisting magnetic field inside. The twist in a tokamak which was made in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, comes from the inside. Tokamaks use a setup like an electrical transformer to make the electrons and ions flow around the tube as an electric current. This current makes a vertically looping magnetic field, which when added to the field already running along the length of the tube, makes the required spiraling field lines. 
Both ways work, but the tokamak is better at keeping plasma together. Part of the reason for this is that the symmetry of a tokamak gives particles easier paths to follow. Anderson says that in stellarators, particles see a lot of ripples and wiggles that make a lot of them disappear. Since the 1970s, most fusion research has been done on tokamaks. This has led to the huge ITER reactor project in France, which is a 16 billion euros international effort to build a tokamak that makes more energy than it uses, which will pave the way for commercial power reactors. But there are major problems with tokamaks. A transformer can only send a current through plasma in short bursts, which are not good for a commercial fusion reactor. The current in the plasma can also suddenly stop, which can cause disruptions, which are sudden losses of plasma confinement that can release magnetic forces strong enough to hurt the reactor. Even designs that are on the rise, like the spherical tokamak, have these kinds of problems. Science, 22 May, page 854. Stellarators, on the other hand, are safe. Their fields come from coils on the outside so they don't need to be pulsed, and there is no plasma current that could get messed up. Some teams have kept working on the idea because of these two things. The large helical device in Toki, Japan, which has been running since 1998, is the largest stellarator that is still in use. The design is a twist on the classic stellarator. It has two helical coils to twist the plasma and other coils to give it even more control. The LHD holds all the major stellarator performance records, works well in steady state, and is getting close to the performance of a tokamak of the same size. Two researchers, Jürgen Nirenberg of IPP and Alan Boozer of PPPL, who now works at Columbia University, figured out that they could do better with a different design that would contain plasma with a magnetic field that was the same strength but changed direction. Per Hellander, an IPP theorist, says that such a quasi-symmetric field wouldn't be a perfect particle trap, but you can get arbitrarily close and get losses to a satisfactory level. It could make a stellarator work, as well as a tokamak, at least in theory. The design strategy is called optimization, and it involves figuring out the shape of the magnetic field that keeps the plasma in the best way, then making a set of magnets to make that field. This requires a lot of computing power, and supercomputers couldn't do it until the 1980s. The first attempt at a partially optimized stellarator was built at the IPP branch in Garching, near Munich. It was called Wendelstein 7 as and it ran from 1988 to 2002. It beat every stellarator record ever made for machines its size. In 1993, researchers at UW Madison set out to make the first device that was fully optimized. The result was the Helically Symmetric Experiment, a small machine that started working in 1999. David Gates, who is in charge of stellarator physics at PPPL, says that W7As and HSX prove that the idea works. Researchers in the US felt confident enough after that to try something bigger. In 2004, PPPL started building the National Compact Stellarator Experiment. It used a different optimization method than IPP, but it was hard to put together the intricately shaped parts to within a millimeter, which caused costs to go up and the schedule to slip. The Department of Energy stopped the project in 2008, when 80% of the major parts had been built or bought. Science, 30, May 2008, page 1142. The manager of NCSX at PPPL, George Hutch Nielsen says, we completely underestimated the cost and the schedule. So that's it for today. Was this video helpful? Share your views in the comments section below. Also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for all the latest updates. Thanks for watching.